Father God, I commit myself to you. And I commit, Lord, all that has been prepared, God, to you. Lord, may it honor you. May you direct the words to, to different individuals, Lord God, that it would not just make sense to them, that it would convict them, and that, it, that, that they would catch hold, Lord, of what you want each and every one of them to do, Lord God. So come, Holy Spirit, take over the entire um, time, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The Colossian church was actually under attack by false teachers you know, that disputed the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus was not really God, lah. that he was one among many uh, different ways to, to reach God. Yeah? So the Colossian church was actually very vulnerable at that time to theological error. Heresies were rising. They were coming from Gnosticism, you know, that claims that uh, we need to have mystical secret knowledge to understand God and spirituality. Gnosticism also claims that matter, that means body, is evil and spirit is good. Therefore, Jesus' work on the cross is meaningless because it is matter and that it could not connect with spiritual. There were also Greek philosophies going around. There was uh, Jewish legalism, which Pastor Alvin covered three Sundays ago. You all remember? He was talking about um, excessive rituals, human tradition, right? And uh, religious festivals. You know, if you don't do this, you're, you know, you're sinful. It's wrong. But, and, and, and he also talked about asceticism. Okay, asceticism is very severe self-discipline uh, or self-denial for religious reasons. So all these, Paul was saying, all these things, they are just mere um, appearances of religious wisdom. It really was not. Yeah? So Paul's letter to the Colossian church was meant to combat wrong teaching, wrong thinking. Because all these things that were creeping in had the potential to fracture the faith of Christians. Question. Today in the 21st century, do you think that we are better off than the collusion controversies? Yeah, that's right. The answer is no. You know, uh, be very aware that we are actually still facing the same thing as the collusion church. You know, except the, the heresies are coming in different names today. And Paul managed this issue at that time, by reminding Christians of core doctrine. So let me check if you guys still remember the core doctrine of Colossians. Can you remember? Okay, Bible trivia. What is the resounding doctrine in Colossians? A, Christ is enough. B, Christ is supreme. C, Christ is first, or D, all of the above. Any takers? D, that's right. Very good. Pass. <laughs> okay, so uh, Christ is above all, and He, and he is uh, all of the above. Yeah? So Paul proclaims in Colossians that Christ is supreme. He is preeminent, which means He surpasses all. He's the greatest. He's the number one. And Paul also proclaims that Christ is sufficient. It means that Christ's work on the cross is enough. You know, you don't have to, uh, I mean, you are complete in Christ. You don't have to look elsewhere to find uh, a salvation. Christ is enough. And it was so important for them at that time. It is so important for us today because we need to stand rightly in a world that is getting very corrupted and very deceptive. Yeah. Let me show you something uh, that came out of the Star newspaper just two weeks ago. Jesus is a man, not a God. Bible seminar by an organization called The Way. You have to watch out, okay? This is one of the many modern heresies that has reached our shores. And in the Philippines, those are our, our churches in the Philippines, you have it even worse. This um, talk 
held by the Way International. By the way, uh, some organizations will keep changing their names to evade detection. So the Way International, they reject the doctrine of the Trinity and they believe that only when their founding leader uh, interprets the Bible and corrects it, then it is correct. Yeah. Okay, so you don't fall for such things. Don't be gullible. I, I know you guys go out and, and you, you, you know, look through Google to find things, but be very careful. Not everything on Google is correct. One. Yeah? So if you read something, you're not sure of the organization, you're not sure of the idea, you have our numbers. Contact us. You know, if we do not know, we can find out for you. We just don't want you to be sheep that goes sasat. Yeah? Lost. And those of you who are interested, Brother Samuel Nissan from Explain International, he, he presented a really good and solid review of this on YouTube. So you can go on and you know, check it out. Another one of the in, that, that is infiltrating the uh, Western Evangelical Church is called Progressive Christianity. Okay, this is a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. I bring this up because all of us, we serve the internet. And whatever happens in America affects us in real time. Yeah? So that's why I bring this up. So to, pro to progressive Christians, the Bible is outdated. They believe that Christian doctrine, um, biblical morality, must follow the times and the culture of today. And, and, and because of that, you know, under the banner of uh, love and justice and equality. They believe in abortion. They believe in same-sex marriage, in sexual freedom. They believe um, that even if you're married, it's okay to have multiple partners. Um, one of the uh, pastors, senior pastors of a progressive church in the States is an active online, uh, sorry, OnlyFans star. Okay? And she has the support of her senior pastor, husband, and the congregation. That is not right, okay? That is not Christianity as God intends. And the thinking is this, okay? If, you are, if it's true for you, then it is truth. That means human opinion is over the Word of God. But Jesus, in the wilderness, when He was you know, being tempted by the devil, He kept going back to the Word of God. He said, it is written that man shall not live on bread alone. It is written, you know, that, that you shall not put the Lord your God to test. And it is said, worship God and serve Him only. Jesus always went back to the Word of God. So who are you to say, oh, I don't agree? Jesus exalted the Word of God. I would like to challenge you on something. When you read something, you hear something, you see something, always ask yourself, do I believe this because it, it sounds awesome? Because it gives me, you know, the vibes? Or, or because it is biblical? What you believe is very important because it dictates how you live. I'll give you an example. What do you think of this? Quotes. How to be happy? Delete do uh, toxic people from your life. Eight types of toxic people to get rid of. Those who spread negativity. Criticize you all the time. Waste your time. Jealous. Play the victim. Don't care. Self-centered. Keep disappointing you. If you fall in any one of the categories, you are considered toxic, so please change. Okay? <laughs> but now, uh, the advice sounds pretty smart. Delete, you know, toxic people from your life completely, you know, because it's about your own happiness, ma. But I have always questioned such quotes. Is this biblical? Does, you know, I mean, how does this line up, you know, for a Christian to line up with this? How does being a pastor line up with this? Can I cancel all of you? Uh? <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously, church should be very small, right? no. <laughs> No, right? Church should be very small. And some of you may even have to can cancel off your own spouse or family member. Right? 
How can we answer God when we are supposed to love God and love people? So this is not biblical. So why am I going on about all this, even though you know, it sounds like it's not related to my topic today? I just want to say that even though we are studying the book of Colossians, the issues that they faced 2,000 years ago is so, so real to us today, and it is much worse. So we have to be alert. We have to be careful. Yeah? Take heed and apply what you learn from Colossians. So Colossians uh, chapters 1 and 2 were doctrinal to reinforce thinking and belief. Chapters 3 and 4 were practical about the believer's new life based on that doctrine and how it should reflect Christ. So this message is not for new believers. Whether you're 20-year-old Christian, 70-year-old Christian, new life is never old. Okay? So let's start reading verse 1, chapter 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So the first part of Colossians 3 establishes the position of a believer. What is your position in Christ? First out, we are dead. Okay? We are dead. For, if Colossians 3.3 3 here says, For you died. Died to what? To our old self. We died to the sin nature. Yeah? And Galatians 2.2, it says, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. No longer I. Have you ever heard of you know, ministers that you know, who were ex-gangsters, ex-homosexuals, or ex-drug addicts, but today they're changed and they're serving God? I'm sure you have heard stories like that, yeah? And if, and if you have a chance to talk to them and ask them, they will tell you, I'm no longer the same person. That man is dead and gone. That's the old. No more. So in the same way, we are dead and gone. We were buried at water baptism, right? Water baptism, we identified with Jesus' death and His burial and His resurrection. That is why water baptism is so important because it is, it is a public confession to tell everybody, hey everyone, the old me is dead. No more. So we are dead. But we are also alive. We are alive to God. Romans 6, 11 says... This is made possible only in Christ Jesus. That means if you are not in Christ today, in God's eyes, you are dead in sin. We were all once dead in sin, and we were on the way to condemnation. But Jesus came, and He died on the cross to make a way for sinful men. Yeah, so, so now, whoever who calls on the name of Jesus and calls Him Savior, calls Him Lord. The Bible says He has crossed the great divide from death to eternal life. So we have new life in God. And it is by Christ and Christ alone. Thirdly, our, yeah, we have new life. Thirdly, our Christ is hidden with, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. If this hand is Jesus. And if this clicker is you, your life is hidden with Christ in God. So that means you are in Christ. So when Christ resurrected, three days after He was crucified, we and all believers in all you know, generations in all of history that have believed in Jesus, they rise with Him. Okay? So being raised with Christ is not a position that is to come. It is not a position that you have to work for. It is a position you have now. As long as you, you know, repent of your sins, you put your trust in Jesus, you are already risen with Christ. 
Now, this is a positional truth that you must grasp. Very important for you to never forget that you are raised with Christ. Because that's the only way to live if you're going to be a victorious Christian, living a victorious Christian life. When you own this truth, you will believe and you will behave victoriously like Christ. Because when you know this, you know that you're no longer a victim, you're a victor. So, you know, if suddenly anxiety comes in, fear comes in and suffocates you, the only way to defeat that is to remember that Christ in you has already defeated death. The resurrection gives us new life. The resurrection gives us a new direction, a new way of living, a new purpose, and a newfound way to say no to sin. Paul says, Now that you are raised with Christ, set your hearts and minds on things above, where Christ is, not on earthly things. The word set here in Greek is a present active imperative, meaning it's a command. And a, a present and an ongoing action. That means you set and you keep on setting your hearts and minds on, on things above. No matter how hard life can get, you know, um, this here is not your home. You are meant for another place. You are meant for heaven. Okay, and that is your destiny. That is your end game. So focus there, not on earthly things. You know, you, you guys used to, or not you guys, I mean too, all of us used to be earthly minded. Everything we did was for this life, but we know that it's going to perish, right? But now that you've been raised with Christ, be heavenly minded. Be on the same page with the Lord. Treasure what He treasures. Desire what He desires. Do you know that um, heavenly minded people are super blessed? Let me just give you two reasons why. Why you want to be heavenly minded. Isaiah 26 3 says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is stayed on you. Wouldn't you want perfect peace in a time of, you know, troubles and storms? Money cannot buy. And then there's Romans 8, 5 to 6. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Who doesn't want that? You want life and peace? Yes. Be heavenly minded. Don't focus on you know, everything around us because we are meant to go in that direction. So the first part, remember your position as a believer, that you have been raised with Christ to a whole new life. So what does this new life look like? This is part two, the practice of a believer. Now that you have this new life, you know, you know your position, how should you live? Live Christocentric, meaning live Christ-centered. Because it's totally inconsistent, right? I mean, for a new you to behave like the old you, it is just as inconsistent for a married man to behave like a single man, right? So there are three things that we need to do if we are to live you know, as made alive in Christ. Firstly, what does Paul say? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Paul says, put to death. If I say to my son, Jaden, put down your handphone. Okay? If I say that, whose responsibility? You lah. Not me, right? Correct? So Paul says here, put to death. So it's your responsibility to deal with your earthly desires. It doesn't matter if the world exalts them, your friends are doing them, or 
or if all your entertainment on Facebook, on telenovela or whatever, is all full of this. Doesn't matter because these are all carnal, they are earthly, they are of the world and they have no place in a Christian. The new you now bears the name of God and the image of God. Yeah, and God hates this. You know that God hates this because it says His wrath is coming for it. Yeah. And, and, and it is idolatry, or rather it has the potential to become an idol in your life because it takes so much in your heart, so much place in your heart. And God does not want that. These things are also destructive. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ died to give us new life. He died, you know, to give us new life. Now it is our turn to confirm our love, our loyalty by giving sin up. Let me just say this, okay? If you are a genuine Christian, if you are a genuine Christian on that path to sanctification, you will never be comfortable with habitual sin. If you are okay with habitual sin, you need to soberly ask yourself if you are saved because you are outrightly defying God. And you need to do more than repent. Paul here says, you need to kill it. Put to death. Put sin to death. Kill it. If it resurfaces because you didn't kill it properly, kill it again. Kill it again and again. I know you guys are very nice people, but you really cannot be nice with sin. So young people, or even old people, when you find yourself in, you know, with a group of friends, about to do something stupid, about to do something impure, get out! Get out! The Bible says, flee! Temptation. Don't care about your, you know, your friends thinking, oh, you chicken, you wuss, or you... Loser, don't care about what they say. You get out. The, the answer is always the cross. To die. Die to sin. Die to self. Because if you don't kill sin, it will kill you. Verse 7, we move on. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. It says here, you used to. That means past tense. Huh? So the sins that was in that last list should be history for you. Don't go back there. If Satan comes and keeps seducing you and, and reminding, you, reminding you of your past, then you remind him of his future. Hey, you have been defeated at the cross. You are headed for the lake of fire and I am not going to be joining you because I have been raised with Christ. Amen. So to those who think, oh, they're just not that first list, huh? not me. Let's read on. Yeah? But now, you must also rid yourself of such things as these. New King James Version says, you must also put off these things. Rage, sorry, anger, rage, Malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Notice that the first list was more internal and more sensual. This second list is more social. Are you a temperamental person? Are people afraid of you because, you know, if they say the wrong thing, you might just blow up? Do you gossip? Do you complain until you de and you damage someone else's reputation? How about your speech? You still have coarse jokes, vulgarity. You know, there are uh, you know, quite a number of sins over here, but I'm just going to pick on one. I'm going to pick on slandering. Verbal assassination of someone's character. I think slandering happens a lot in our world today. Yeah, and it carries into the church, sadly. 
But I'm going to ask you something very sensitive here. At home, do you slander a leader and then wonder why your family doesn't want to go to church? Do you slander a leader and then wonder why they don't want to go to that connect group? You influence another person negatively and very unfairly because of your own opinions. And that has the possibility of hurting the body of Christ. You are playing into the devil's schemes. And you can hurt this body of Christ. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, gives a very stern warning what God hates. You read the very last line, sec, uh, last two lines. God hates one who sows discord among brothers. What is discord? Conflict. Division. Slander can bring division. And Pastor Stanley Lim, two weeks ago, he said, a divided church will never fulfill God's purposes. Is this what you want? I pray that it doesn't happen to us. You know, that we fail to fulfill God's purposes because of our own differences. But the Lord says that His blessing is on unity. You know, Jesus in the Beatitudes, He said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Wow. I wonder what he calls the one who divides his church. So we must put off our earthly nature. In verse 9, do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with all its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. I like what Pastor Skip Heidzig explains of uh, verse 9 to 10. He said, this is when theology becomes beology. When the knowledge of God shapes the new you that you have become. You have taken off your old self and your old practices. You now have new life and you bear the image of Christ. So don't lie anymore. You know, when I read, when I read this part, I was asking God, why of all the sins, uh, you say, don't lie? You know, since you have put off the old and you've taken on the new, the first sin you talk about is don't lie. Why? And then I, I, God told me, who is the father of lies? Who's the father of lies? Satan. So don't emulate that anymore. Emulate Christ. And in this new image of Christ, there is no, this, uh, there is no distinction. There is no partiality among people. It doesn't matter if you are a ruffian or a gentleman, you are charismatic or you, or you are reformed. There is unity in, through the blood of Jesus Christ. And this is what makes the church so unique. Yeah? We can be of different colors. We have different colors here today. Yeah? We, have, we can be of different colors, background, status, but we are equal in Him. We can lay down our differences and I can call you my family. How? Because through Christ. Christ is sufficient and in Christ, He unites us as one body. So now that we have put off our earthly and sinful self, nature, and we must put on the new nature. Verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves in, with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, 
put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Paul tells the Christians, now that you all are new people with new life, you are chosen of God and He calls you holy. It's so amazing, you know, for God, if you believe in Christ, He calls you holy and, he, and you are dearly loved. And since that is the case, please put on the new nature of God because you are His people, you are His children, you are His ambassadors. Have any of you been to Friday's, the restaurant, TGIF, Friday's? Yeah, praise. I don't know if you have it in your country, but it's an American restaurant. Yeah, Fridays. Every Friday's restaurant that you go to, when you step in, you will be well greeted, and all the waiters are very well trained to be super friendly, right? Yeah. And if you apply for a job there as a waiter, they won't care if you're an introvert or not. The moment a customer steps in through the door. Yeah, you, you jolly well give the loudest and most cheerful greeting. Welcome to Fridays! Right? You must learn to carry the culture of your organization. That's what you do, right? In your companies. This is the culture of the kingdom. And the boss is telling us, buck up, okay. All these virtues can also cause the church to live in unity and in harmony. Remember the verse before this? This one. Every kind of people coming together in a church. Don't think that there is no toxic people there, okay? There will be toxic people there and some of them will come to your connect groups and you cannot delete them. Yeah. And what does it take to unite such a diverse people? Only the love of God. So I think that this picture, it explains it very clearly. If we put on love, if we embrace the love of God, all these things will come naturally in time. So, under the practice of the believer, we are to put off old nature, put on the new nature, and thirdly, we are to practice Christ-centered living. I'll read verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace, and be thankful so verse 15 tells us that we need to practice peace and thankfulness in this body of Christ. Question, are you at peace with yourself, within yourself? Are you at peace with one another here? Are you thankful for what the Lord has brought together here at High Praise? I know I am. So if there are any strained relationships here in this church, any broken relationships, I encourage you, please uh, make an effort to reconcile. You know, because Jesus' desire is to see unity, peace, and people loving one another. Verse 16, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. In the New King James, it says the word of Christ. I dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. So worship and word must be alive in your hearts and must be alive in our community. Those of you doing daily living water groups, those of you doing connect groups, this is what you are doing. You are allowing the Word of God to dwell among you week after week, year after year. So keep going. You are doing God's will. And it, this verse also tells us to sing. Sing and worship God with gratitude. Verse 17. And what 
When, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. When you talk to one another here in church, and not only here in church, like wherever, yeah? And if Jesus was standing there in your midst, would He be glorified? Or would He be mortified? Oh, you talk like that. No, la. Okay. How is your work attitude in church? In any ministry that you are in? Are you grateful to serve? Or do you go, Alama, me again. Me again. How is your attitude when it comes to serving? You know, be excellent and be grateful because everything you do is not for us, it's for the Lord. It's in the name of the Lord. So all this that you see here, this is the will of God for those of us who are in new life. So in summary, because Christ is supreme, the believer's new life should reflect that priority. And you need to know your position. You, that you have been raised with Christ. And you no longer are that same earthly, sinful, defeated person. You are now an overcomer with the Lord's grace. So be heavenly minded. And secondly, know the practice of those with new life. And this, question yourself. Put off the sinful nature, all that is sensual, you know, all the sensual sins, the social sins, kill them. Put on godly nature, put on God's love. And thirdly is to practice Christ-centered living. Jackie Pullinger, many years ago, she walked in the slums of Hong Kong and she came across um, a girl living in quite a bad condition and um, she was a prostitute. But Jackie Pullinger shared the gospel with her. The girl accepted Christ and she was soon incorporated into the church. But fast forward, you know, a few years, the day came when she stood in the aisle of her church, all dressed in white, to marry the man of her dreams. It was a very emotional moment because here was someone, an ex-prostitute, so broken, so used, no hope, no future, but she found Jesus. Or rather, Jesus found her. And her life turned around. She never looked back into her old life. Never. It's all in the past. Now, she's walking into new life. And that day, on her wedding day, she stood more than a conqueror in Christ. So, brothers and sisters, be reminded that there is power in the resurrected life. But it takes you to cooperate with the Holy Spirit for victory. It's not going to be easy, but I'm going to share one last thing with you, a tip that can help make your journey smoother. This is a quote by Pastor Brian Chappell. Oops. The only reason sin has power over your life is because you love it. The only power that can overcome that is a greater love for Christ. So church, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Put Him first and let's live that victorious life. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank You for this morning's word. Lord, whatever that has been spoken whatever that has been set forth, Lord. Lord, I pray that every individual will remember, God, that one thing, God, that you want them to change in their own lives, God. The one thing that they need to respond to, Lord. Lord, let them not forget that, God. This entire week, Lord, drive that word deep within, God. Let it take root. Let it bring a change that you desire, God. I thank you, God, for new life. I thank you for resurrection power that comes for all those who believe, God. And Lord, if there are those among us who, do, who have yet to know you, but today, Lord, they want to say yes to you, Lord. Let them recognize, Lord, that they are 
sinners, that they are sinful before a holy God and that they need forgiveness, God, from you, Lord. Let them know, Lord, that you came and died on the cross 2,000 years ago to pay the penalty of their sins, that they may be forgiven, that they may be made righteous and that way be made open to, end, to go to heaven, Lord God. And let them know, Lord, that this day, God, when they say yes to you, this day when they cling on to you, Lord, and, and as they choose to follow you, Lord, this day is new life for them, God. And that this day they too are raised with you in the heavenlies, God. So Father, I commit the uh, congregation and, and everything that has been said. Take over, Lord. Lead us, guide us as we set our eyes on you as we, as we um, yeah, set our eyes and our hearts and our minds on you, Lord. Let there, let there be victory, Father, that comes into our lives, God. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me? And we're going to close with the very first song that you sang this morning because you are a new creation. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Thank you, Lord. All things are passed away. That's right. I'm born again. More than a conqueror. That's who I am. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Sing it again. I'm a new creation. That's right. I'm a brand new man. All things are passed away, I am born again, more than a conqueror, that's who I am, I'm a new creation, I'm a brand new man, come on one more last time, I'm, I'm a, a new, new creation, I'm a brand new man. thankful for the privilege to call you Abba Father, the privilege to be your children. I was never to take that for granted. The people, oh Lord, the people will recognize, Lord, that now we can have access to the very throne of grace because of the blood of Jesus shed for us on the cross. I was never to take that for granted, that as a new creation, we no longer need, oh Lord, to lean on that which is in the past, that which once held us back. For in you, Lord, we now have the strength and ability to say no to the sin and temptation that comes. And in you, Lord, we can have the victory in moving forward in the new things that you have. That in Christ, we have a new nature. That now, Lord, we can put on that which is of you. And put off, oh Lord, that which is of the flesh. And so this day, Father, oh Lord, we pray for that intentionality, for the strength, the grace for each one of us each day to put on that which you uphold, Lord, want to, O Lord, bring forth in our lives. And, O Lord, to put off, O Lord, that which, O Lord, is of the flesh. So that, Lord, your goodness, Father, will overflow in each one of our lives. We thank you, Father, O Lord, that we know that we are not alone in this journey. For you are with us. A reminder, Lord, that Christ in us, the hope of glory. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are indeed our sustainer, our hope, our shield, our shelter, our shalom, our sufficiency, and our shepherd. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now as you go, may the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each one of you.